Welcome to this session on prioritizing technical debt as if time and money matters. So this is a broad topic, so I would like to jump right in and get started by looking at what forces do we have to balance when building large-scale software systems. And these forces and challenges are well captured in something called Lehman's Laws of Software Revolution. And there are multiple laws, but today I just want to present the two most important to you and see if they resonate with your experience. So let's look at the first law. The first law is the law of continuous change. Well, Lima claims that as a system evolves, it has to continuously adapt or it will become progressively less useful over time. Is this something you recognize? Yeah, this is the very reason why we keep adding new stuff, why we keep adding new features to our existing code bases, because we need to keep them relevant to our users. We might even have to respond to competitors. So this is something that I guess we have all seen, right? What I wanted to do now is to have a look at the second law of software evolution. And please note the contrast. The second law is the law of increasing complexity. Where Lima claims that as a system evolves, its complexity will increase unless we actively try to reduce it. So do you see the tension between these two laws? On one hand, we have to continuously adapt and evolve our code base, but when we do that, its complexity increases, which in turn makes it harder and harder to respond to change. And the problem is that we, when we run into this, what we will note is most likely symptoms and not the real root cause. And to make it worse, we will note different symptoms depending on who we are, what our role is. So, for example, a technical manager might note symptoms on a roadmap. It takes longer and longer to implement new features. As a consequence of that, we lose predictability. Our end users, however, will see symptoms on the external quality of the code base. So they will see this. They will see bugs. And the real root causes remain largely hidden, opaque, and obscured. So how can we bring visibility to technical debt? Well, a simple thing that we could do is, of course, to quantify it, right? And this is something that I have seen done and attempted a number of times. So let me share a story with you. So as part of my day job, I analyze code. In practice, that means I go to different sites, I analyze their code bases, and I try to come up with recommendations and suggest improvements. And a couple of years ago, I worked with this really interesting organization that prior to my arrival had tried to quantify their technical debt. So what they've done is that they've taken a static analysis tool capable of quantifying technical debt and thrown that at their 15 year old code base. Now, this tool reported that on your 15 year old code base, you have accumulated 4,000 years of technical debt. 4,000 years of technical debt. Let's put that into perspective. 4,000 years ago, that was here. 4,000 years ago, that was the start of recorded history. So in this case, I'm well aware that 4,000 years of technical debt might actually be accurate because I understand that on that 15 year old code base, a lot of that debt accumulated by having hundreds of developers working on the code in parallel. So maybe it's accurate, it's definitely depressing, but how useful is it? How do we act upon this data? And this is where many organizations turn south. Because what tends to happen when we get a large amount of issues is that we put a quantitative goal on it. All right, so we have 7,000 major issues. Let's invest three months and bring that number down to just 5,000 issues. And when I hear that, I always, always advise against it. Because to me, going from 7,000 major issues down to 5,000, it's a little bit like jumping from the fifth instead of the seventh floor. And we also have to consider what kind of behavior that we reinforce. And the reason I say this is because people like me, developers, we are human after all, and like most humans, we will optimize for what we are being measured on. So if we are optimized on a quantitative goal, so what we will do is that we will make sure we meet that goal. And we will do that by picking issues that we might be the most comfortable with, 
or the issues that look the easiest to solve. Because what's always lacking with the quantitative review is the most important aspect, and that's the business impact. So how can we get that? Well, let's start by summing up where we actually are. I hope to show you in this introduction that quantifying technical debt might be an interesting exercise, but it's not really actionable. We cannot act upon that data. And in particular, we're always going to have this trade-off between improving existing code versus adding new features. And it's a trade-off that's going to shift over time. So we need to balance it accordingly. So how do we do that? Well, those of you who have read any one of my books, you know that I'm a big, 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 big fan of version control data. Yeah, so I guess we all have our odd hobbies. This one happens to be mine. But the reason I'm so fascinated by version control is because version control is a goldmine of information. It's virtually a behavioral log of how we as developers have interacted with our code base. And we can tap into that information to prioritize technical depth. So let me show you how that looks. And let me show you on a real world code base. So this is a code base that I think a lot of you might actually carry around in your pocket right now. I'm talking about Android. More specifically, I'm talking about the part of Android known as the Platform Framework Base. So the Platform Framework Base is a pretty large code base, approximately 3 million lines of code, written by more than 2,000 developers. And what you see here on screen is what I call a hotspot visualization. So let me start by walking through the visualization so that you know how to read it. So what I've wanted to do first is to look at those large circles, the ones that blink on screen here. Each one of those represents a top level folder. So if this was your code base, the name of those folders, you would recognize them as important subsystems or top level modules. It's also an interactive visualization, so we can zoom in to any level of detail that we're interested in. And once we do that, we see that each file with source code is visualized as a circle. And you see that those circles, they have different size and different colors. That's because size is used to represent code complexity. So how do we measure code complexity? Well, I'm going to reveal that in just a minute. But before I go there, I want to point out that code complexity is the least important aspect. Because code complexity has this property that complex code, it's only an issue when we have to deal with it. So first, we need to figure out, does this complexity actually affect us? Does it have an impact on us as an organization? And this is data that we can pull out of our virtual control history. We can look at the change frequency of each piece of code, the code churn. And we can use color to visualize that. And when we combine these two dimensions, we're capable of identifying complex code that we have to work with often. And those are our hotspots. All right, I promise to talk about code complexity. What I do when it comes to code complexity is I use a concept I call code health. How healthy is our code? And in code health, what I do is I basically look for a number of factors that are known from research to impact the costs of maintaining code and the risk for the effects. And those factors, they include classic cases like uh, low cohesion. So a hotspot might have too many responsibilities, which is typically one reason why it attracts a lot of development activity. Another thing I look for, which I find much more interesting than traditional complexity metrics, it's what I refer to as the bumpy road code smell. So the bumpy road code smell is, uh, is simply a function that has multiple complicated blocks of logic. So I have a reference at the bottom of the slide where you can read a bit more about the code, code smell bumpy road. But the idea is that just like driving on a bumpy road in your car, just like that would slow down your driving, a bumpy road in code will slow down your code reading and lead to a lower comprehension of the code, which in turn increases the risk for defects. And this is something that we can see in a related code smell, which is deeply nested logic. In fact, there's some pretty good research on deeply nested logic 
that suggests that roughly 20% of all programming mistakes that we do are due to things like if statements inside if statements inside other if statements. So when inspecting a hotspot, I tend to emphasize deeply nested logic. All right, so we have an issue here, but what happens to that hotspot over time? This is something that we can answer by turning to version control data again. So I go to version control data and I pull out each historic revision of that hotspot. And then I measure the number of lines of code at each point in time, as well as a complexity number. And then I plot it in a graph so that we can see the trend over time. And the number of lines of code, that's pretty simple to calculate, right? And in many cases, that's good enough. However, I find it useful to add a second complexity dimension, the red line that you see here on screen. And what I tend to use as a complexity metric is that I tend to focus on the levels of nesting depth inside that function. But basically, you can use whatever you have easily at hand. And the reason I say this is because, again, code complexity is the least interesting aspect. The absolute values are simply not that interesting. What's interesting, though, is the trend. Does it grow better or worse over time? And looking at our Android hotspot activity manager service here, we see that we might have a major issue because, first of all, it's a hotspot, so we know it's relevant. It has a number of code health issues. And when we work with that code, it gets worse and worse and worse. So this is clearly a hotspot that we would need to refactor. So who would like to have that task? The activity manager service consists of 20,000 lines of code. And even more challenging, that code is developed by 74 developers just over the past three months. So what this means to us is that we cannot just branch out. Because if we work on that branch for an extended period of time, we will never, ever be able to merge it back. So how do we prioritize? Where do we start? To answer that question, I use another behavioral code analysis technique that I call Hotspots X-Ray. So what I do here is that I take that large hotspot, I parse it into separate functions, and then I look at the git log, where do each commit hit over time? And I sum it up, and I get hotspots on a function and method level. So let's have a look at our Android hotspot and see what we can find. In Android, we see that the number one hotspot on a method level it's a function called handle message. And we see that that function has been modified 98 times just over the past year. So at least twice a week, some developer is affected by excess complexity in that function. And we can get a hint on that complexity in the last column here, the cyclomatic complexity. So cyclomatic complexity is a rough metric that basically calculates the number of logical paths through a function. And this is interesting because with a complexity value of 106, it basically means that we would need at least 106 unit tests just to cover this function. Now, looking at the size of handle message, we see that it consists of 500 lines of code. 500 lines, it's a lot for a single function, isn't it? It is. But, and here's the good news, 500 lines is definitely less than 20,000 which was the size of a total hotspot. And 500 lines of code is absolutely less than 3 million lines of code, which was the size of a total code base. So more importantly, we are now at the level where we can act upon this data and do a focused refactoring based on how we, as an organization, have interacted with our code. Before I leave time for questions, I will make sure that I managed to explain why hotspots work so well to prioritize technical depth. So please have a look at the following graphs. They all show exactly the same data. On the x-axis, you have each file in the system, and those files are sorted according to the change frequency. That is, how many commits have we done to that particular file? And the number of commits the change frequency is what you see on the y-axis. Now, if you look at the three examples here, you see that I have graphs from three completely different code bases, implementing different languages by different people, different organizations, targeting different domains, different lifetime spans, 
everything is different. And yet, they all show exactly the same pattern. They show a power law distribution. And this is something I've found in every single code base that I've ever analyzed. And I think I've analyzed somewhere around 300 code bases by now. So this seems to be the way code evolves. And this is important to us because what this means to us is that most of our code is going to be in the long tail. That is code that's rarely, if ever, used. Most of our development activity, on the other hand, is going to be in a relatively small part of the code. And this is what hotspots do for us. They identify that smaller part of the code where we do most of our work, the code with the highest interest rate, so that we can identify our refactoring candidates there and be pretty sure that if we act upon that technical depth, we get a real benefit in terms of business impact. But hotspots can do more for us. Hotspots can also help us identify the parts of the code where we shouldn't necessarily invest in refactorings just now. And I cover this in my book. I have a chapter with the title, Your Best Bug Fix is Time. And I base that chapter on some really fascinating research. What researchers have done in this case is that they have studied how aging impacts correctness. So what they found out was that code that hadn't been modified in a year, code that had been stable for a year, had a roughly one third fewer defects than code that has been recently modified. And this is interesting because what hotspots do is that they help us identify that stable code so that we know that, all right, if we have stable code, maybe we can live with a certain degree of technical depth there. Now, the reason we have this effect is because code grows stable for two different reasons. The first and uh, very obvious reason is because it's dead code. Dead code tends to be very stable. And dead code is actually the best kind of code you can have because you can simply delete it. And less code is always better. The second reason that code uh, grows stable is typically because it has been debugged and tested into functionality. It's code that just does its job. It's code that has been uh, battle tested and proven in use. And code of that quality is also great to have. So using hotspots, you can draw the separation between code where you cannot really allow technical depth and code where it's fairly safe to live with technical depth. Building large-scale software systems is never going to be easy. So I'm pretty convinced that we as developers, we need all the support we can get to make our job a little bit easier. And I hope that this uh, introduction to behavioral code analysis has inspired you to investigate the field in more depth. So I would like to leave you with a number of references where you can read up more on the topic. So let's start with the tooling, because that tends to be where I get most of the questions. So for this presentation, I use the CodeSyn tool to do all the analysis. And CodeSyn is available at codesyn.io, so please check it out. At codesyn.io, you will also find a number of uh, analyses of well-known open source code bases. So have a look at them and browse the interactive analysis result. I'm also maintaining an open source library called uh, CodeMat, which is a command line tool capable of doing hotspot analysis. So please check out my GitHub if you're interested in that. If you want to dive deeper into this topic, I recommend Software Design X-Rays, which is my latest book. It covers hotspots and many, many more behavior code analysis techniques. I blog regularly at npr.com as well as adamthornhill.com. So with that covered, I would like to take this opportunity and say thanks. Thanks a lot for listening to me and may the code be with you. Thank you.